a weekly cable show with John Wilcott. As often as not, about travel or containing travel. Hi, I'm John Wilcock, and this is Wait a Minute. I got a big surprise recently. I uh, was wandering around Ojai. I went to some function or other, I think at the Arts Center, and I met somebody who had actually seen my show. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was in the library, and Kit Willis, the librarian, also said she'd seen my show. Well, this was a big shock. The reason being that I'd been on for more than two years in Ojai, and nobody ever before told me they saw the show. There's a simple explanation, which is that it used to be out at four o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon. Now I ask you, who's watching cable TV at four o'clock on a Wednesday afternoon? If anybody's watching television at all, they're probably watching Oprah or something like that. So my shift to seven o'clock on Tuesday night was very dramatic. It had this effect of actually finding uh, me an audience. Not that I've always been, not that I've ever really been bothered about an audience, because believe it or not, I've been doing this show since the uh, mid 80s. And uh, I started on Manhattan Cable. I used to do it live on Sunday night on, in New York. And then I took my camera and I started to wander around and I did it oh, all over the world. I'm a travel writer. And uh, when I came to Ojai, I had all these back shows. Well, not all of them, but a, a large number of shows. And, uh, and I gave them to Carol at, um, at the uh, Adelphia. And she started running them on uh, Channel 8, which is why you've been seeing it. Anyway, what I'm going to do is, uh, now that I know that I actually have an audience here, even if it's only two people, I'm going to um, concentrate a bit more on talking and intersperse the talking with bits of tape, maybe that I've done already and maybe that I will take specially. So uh, I'll come back later in the show. I will never know probably what I'm going to run next, but uh, it'll be a big surprise and uh, you'll just have to wait and see, I guess. the campo. It pulls right down below. And a man's painting away down there. Painting these little tops to the um, tables. Pretty garden. Very nice little hotel to stay at. I'm living in this little apartment right at the end of the balustrade type thing. Here's my little apartment. There's the soup I'm just about to eat. Here's the little kitchenette. main room. Very cozy. And beside the closet, which is quite large, but of course doesn't have enough coat hangers, is the little bathroom. Not being heated, the pool requires a little determination to drop into. A bit chillier than I'm used to, but um, I grit my teeth most days and try and bear it for a couple of laps. I love this Bougain beer, which is so common in Mexico and California for that matter. At the Santo Domingo Church, I don't know what year it is, but it's probably 17th century. There's another row at the side. The cactus is at this side. My Spanish is not very good, but that's uh, something about the, the political politicization of the war, I guess. Stop the politicization of the war. As you get past the church, it gets busier and busier. Out of hanging up for Christmas time. This little plaza has an open air art show. 
Some of it's nice, but most of it's typical. I just have a shot of that. One great thing about the Zocalo is it's never boring. Anyway, I think it's time to grab a sidewalk cable and have an espresso and think about everything. As you can see, you can barely move to go. It's who on earth buys all the things that everybody else sells. Looks like half the population is selling stuff to the other half. As I remarked earlier on, I've been doing this show for 14 years. I used to pay $50 a week to go on Manhattan Cable from a little studio in, uh, in New York and do this live show and um, talk about stuff that I'd done during, you know, since the last show. And one of the things about doing a show in New York is you've got to pretty much be very hip and up to date. I mean, for example, if I started talking about stuff and I hadn't read that day's Sunday Times, any of the audience who were watching would say, oh, what an idiot, he hasn't even read the Sunday Times today. So I was always very up to date. The result of that was that I would talk about things sometimes that the local stations wouldn't get around to until three or four days later. So, so in my own little way, I had these scoops. Well, then I, I, um, I quit doing the show live and I bought a camera and I started to wander around and I soon, soon realized that I absolutely could not afford post-production. And what post-production means to anybody who doesn't know is that when people videotape, they videotape miles and miles and miles of tape just like the old filmmakers used to do and then go back and spend hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars of editing it down to 28 minutes which is the length of a show. So what I decided to do was 28 minutes and edit as I went along so that all I had to do basically was dub to another tape and that would be the show. Well, of course, it resulted in a few overlooked glitches and a few things like that, but that didn't matter because I'm a fairly good travel writer. I've been a travel writer since I left the New York Times. Well, I started the New York Times as a travel writer uh, back in the early 60s. And I've done uh, something like 30 travel books since then in many, many countries. And even when I wasn't doing travel books, I was often traveling, and I took my camera with me. I was in Hungary, I was in Australia, I was in Japan, I was in England, I was in France, Germany, um, Amsterdam, Paris, all over the place, Rome. And uh, so I did a lot of shows, some of which are so old but, uh, that I still have copies of them, or, or rather Adelphia has copies of them and occasionally runs them. So once in a while you'll see some really out of date show, but apart from any topical references, it's still pretty valid. And um, so um, anyway, I will uh, show something. I don't want to talk too long continuously, so I will talk through this tape, but I will intersperse my bits of conversation with occasional um, other in inserts of I don't know what, but we'll see.
a lot of kids never watched it anyhow. Yeah. weren't allowed to. So I'm famous for I Dream of Genie yeah. still. As a matter of fact, I was signing some autographs the other day, and two little 16-year-old girls came up and said, were you Major Nelson uh, on I Dream of Genie? I said, yeah. And they said, you used to be really hot. At least they remember it. Yeah. Yeah. That's nice, Joe. So now, <laughs> this is my wife, Mai. Hi. How are you? I got a tape recorder on, but I that's okay. I'm Jim Buckley. I do. So I guess I want to know about then your connection. Not really. Oh. Uh, not of my age. See, I'm 71 now, uh -huh. and people are not really interested. In, there's not any good roles for 71 people, unless they're presidents or something like that. And also, I have a reputation uh, as Jr. of being Tight. a bad guy. Mm. And then Jeannie, I have a great guy. Yeah. But uh, okay. I don't know what it is. Do you know about then your connection? Before, I mean, were you a designer? Or was I just signed clothes. I see, right. Right, I see. So you'd had some experience in this kind of thing. Right. I think I've done six houses altogether. It's a beautiful house, really beautiful. Once you get outside that big main room, here's the view. Kind of fabulous. You can see for miles. view of the house on the hill from a distance, actually from the gate, showing what a long drive it is on the way there, or back. Well, doing a show in the camera and editing as you go along is really a very interesting exercise because you have to vary it as you go along and not insert the varied bits later on. For example, in every show I try to get an animal or more animals, uh, a poster of some kind, uh, something with some wording on it anyway, signpost, poster, whatever. Um, always uh, somebody may be talking or somebody close up and uh, scenery and so on. And I try to um, vary this so that people really never quite know what's coming next. But the show is called Wait a Minute, which implies wait a minute and something else will come along. Being uh, Having been trained on tabloid newspapers, I was uh, always trained to do things very tight and short and exactly the same way as I do in a camera. I, do, I never run anything. I mean, the longest thing I ever run may be a two or three minute interview. One of the problems that arises sometimes is that um, I might run across some musicians or some music and they might be sitting on a corner, street corner and playing and, uh, and I'd like to get the continuation of whatever it is they're playing and of course if I keep putting the camera off I won't do that so I have to continue with the music and, and find something to put the camera on in the meantime in other words I have to before I put the camera on the musicians in the first place I have to figure okay well what am I going to pan to and the music will continue without interruption so there's that and then the other thing is that sometimes I start to talk about something when I'm somewhere and there's much more that I want to say than the, than the visuals will, uh, will accommodate. So I might start staying, telling a story or something like that, put the camera off, and then look for something else further down the line, maybe further down the street, and pick up exactly where I left off and continue so that uh, if I do it right, it's, it lo it's just as if I'd edited it, that my conversation is continuous, but the background changes. Uh, in the same way, for example, if I go to Las Vegas, now everybody has seen, when they've seen bits of Las Vegas, they've seen um, uh, video of, uh, of the lights. Maybe the lights of one casino and another, and just one after the other, you know, flash, 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 flash. Well, that is done by editing tremendous amount of tape into like 
very short segments, you know, a few seconds for each one and then, then on to the next casino and so on. So instead of taking lots of tape and then editing it, what I do is I go and I do five seconds on Caesar's Palace logo and then I do maybe three seconds on the Aladdin and then maybe I do ten seconds on the Venetian or something like that, just continuously. And when you show it, it's the same effect. It's just as if you'd edited it together, except that you've done it continuously. So little tricks like that you, you uh, pick up as you go along. Uh, I recommend editing in the camera. It saves a lot of money, saves a lot of time, and it's really quite effective. The other thing about uh, the amateur sloppy way in which I do things is that it's much more real. I mean, uh, I intend to do many more things around Ojai now that I know people are actually watching, even if it's only two people. Uh, Lee Fitzgerald is a good local show, but his show is very professional. It's very slick. It's, it, the visuals are great. It's well edited and all the rest of it. I don't want to do a show like that. I like my, my sloppy uh, way of doing things, which is very casual and very real, and usually in real time. And, uh, and so I intend to continue doing that. Now, the big disadvantage is that I am a lousy cameraman. I'm the first to admit it. Believe it or not, I've done 800 shows over the years, in the 15 years or more that I've been doing it. And, and I'm a, as, as terrible a cameraman now as I was when I began. Well, as I was saying earlier, I'm not only a terrible cameraman, but I'm terrible at anything technical at all. 
and uh, you know I mean nobody can fix the well not I, nobody but very few people know how to do the time shift thing on the on the VCR so that they can record a program when they're not there mine is, is broken down now anyway but uh, but I, I, it's very hard to learn to master that as for computers don't get me on that I mean I my ex-wife stayed in my place while I was away one year got me a nice new computer and it's totally baffling it's an emac i absolutely don't understand it it's it's, it's it asks me stupid questions i have no idea what the answer is I just absolutely literally can't handle it, so I went back to using my 10-year-old computer, which works quite well, and which is, by contrast, very simple, and so uh, I tend to use that all the time, and the new one sits idle. It is connected to the internet, which I rarely use. Oh, there's a bluebird over there. And, and even though I have an email address, I never give it to anybody, because I don't like email. But firstly, I think that if you start using email, you've got to look at it all the time. I've seen all these people who get crazed about they can't go for more than a few hours without checking to see if anybody's sent them email. So self-important. I mean, I understand that for business you couldn't do without it, but people personally really don't need email. It's just a toy that they love to play with. I mean, you know, you can phone people, you can fax them, you can write them. Oh, horrors, people actually sitting down and writing something and buying a stamp and mailing it. That terrifies people. I've been doing that all my life and I continue to do it. But to get back to the technical thing, with cameras, the camera that I'm now looking into, for example, it's propped up on a C Columbia, um, Columbia, uh, 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 let's see, an Oxford Dictionary it's propped up on, facing me, it sits on a stool, and I'm sat on a chair opposite it, about a, about a, a yard, a meter away from the lens. Um, this particular camera, I bought it in Japan, cost me about 600 bucks. It's marvelous. It's only the size of maybe a clenched fist. Really a beautiful little camera. But 90% of the stuff on it, I absolutely don't understand. For example, the early cameras, they used to have a little button and you could fade in and out. It was really simple. This one, you have to go to the menu, pick the right thing, set it to fade, and then when you're ready to, pardon me, when you're ready to use it, fade out. Who wants to go through all that nonsense? When I want to fade out, I just want to press a button. Can't do that anymore. Not only that, I don't even understand it. I don't even understand how to do it. Never mind using it. So uh, I'm, I'm a technical, I'm, I'm just a, a totally hopeless technical incompetent. Not that it bothers me. I mean, I can get by quite well without this stuff. And then the LA Times ran a marvelous piece recently by some woman I remember meeting in New York years ago. And she was complaining about, no, not complaining, she was saying how little she needs all the things people need today. They need to be up to date with everything. They need to be watching HBO and all the rest of it. And she doesn't bother and she doesn't care. And I'm exactly the same way. I noticed in my amusement there were several letters in the Times on subsequent days all saying pretty much the same thing which was, oh, how much we agree with you, how much uh, today's technical achievements leave us cold and have left us in the past, and how Luddite we are and how f proud of it we are, if, if not uh, quite accepting of it. Anyway, as again, again, I've talked a bit too long, so we'll have another piece, and then I'll come back and say goodbye.
to do in advance, but what I did in this show was the first segment after I spoke was um, a little bit uh, of when I stayed in Oaxaca, Mexico, and the second was uh, Larry Hagman at his house on Sulphur Mountain. He was being interviewed by Jim Buckley of the Montecito Journal, for which I write a column, and I tagged along that day. And the third and fourth segments were both from Malaysia, uh, some ethnic dancers, which I thought were kind of nice. And that'll wrap it up for this time, and uh, I hope I'll see you next week, or at least I hope you'll see me next week. Okay, John Wilcox, signing off.